good morning and welcome to worship with New Life Metropolitan Community Church. Those of you on site, those of you who may be joining us live stream or even later in the week. We're just regular folks who believe that God's love is for all people. So please make yourself at home. Let God's Spirit speak to you as we worship together. Alice, you're going to come and read our uh, gathering call in English. And I asked you to respond in the bold. And you're going to have to put up with my Spanish today. So <laughs> say a prayer for that and help me out if you'd like to. Go ahead, Alice. Arise, shine for your light has come. For the glory of the Lord has risen upon us. Porque la gloria de Jehová ha nacido sobre vosotros. Behold, the shadows of the night shall cover the earth, and thick the deep, thick shadows of the night shall cover the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you. Pero sobre ti amansará el Señor. And his glory will be seen upon you. Y su gloria será vista sobre ti. The nations shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes all around and see. Alzad vuestros ojos en derredor y mirad. They all gather together. And to you, your sons and your daughters shall come from afar. Ellos vienen a ti, vuestros hijos y vuestros hijas vendrán de lejos. Then you shall see and be radiant. Our hearts shall be thrilled with exaltation and praise. Nuestros corazones se estremecerán con exaltación y albanza. A multitude of camels shall cover you, our Lord and King. The young camels of Midian and Epa, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense. And they too shall bring good news, the praises of the Lord. Y ellos también traerán buenas nuevas, las alabanzas del Señor. May God bless this reading and the hearing of the Holy Scriptures as we sing together. Gracious and merciful God, creator and savior of us and your spirit touching us today in this place and space, live in a new, fresh in this new year, fall on us as we come to worship you, as we come to celebrate your love and life and to do it individually but also collectively together. We thank you and praise you for all that you are and all that you make it possible for us to be and discover and live into as well. And all God's children said... Amen. Amen. Before you're seated, turn around and say good morning to someone. Wave to somebody across the aisle. If you're joining us by live stream, make a comment and let us know you're here. We're delighted to have you joining us in worship today. You may be seated. On this first Sunday after Advent, you may be thinking, why are we still having Christmas decorations up unless you're one of those people that keep them up till July or all year round? You do now have permission after today to take them down. Uh, it, it, Epiphany was on January the 6th, and that's the 12 days of Christmas that we sing about, hear about. And depending on our faith traditions, I know I grew up low church Baptist. We didn't hear much about Epiphany. Everybody showed up at the manger all at the same time. Uh, but we're celebrating Epiphany today, and we'll be talking more about that. Take just a moment and look at what's happening uh, on your sheet and a number of things that are coming up. On Tuesday, and if you're not aware, the 
50 plus and thriving group that's sponsored by the LGBT Life Center has been meeting here each month and they've done everything from crafts to wreath making. This coming week at 10 a.m., it's usually in the afternoon, but at 10 a.m. is a special concert, a brass and keyboard. I think they have trumpet and flugelhorn and French horn and keyboard. That's at 10 a.m. this Tuesday. Uh, I'm not so sure if you have to RSVP, just come on if you haven't, but the information to respond in RSVP to Sid Neighbors is there. On Wednesday evening uh, will be the first uh, regular board meeting of this year, so keep our board in, in your prayers as we move forward, and you'll probably be hearing next Sunday that we'll be calling at the time that we normally have our year-end or first-of-the-year congregational forum. We'll probably be calling a congregational meeting, not for anything bad or anything crisis that's going on, but the board hopes to be able to present to all of us uh, the strategic plan that we are putting together and to share that and to get some input and some affirmation from you all moving forward. That meeting would be at the end of January, on January the 29th, if we call it, and I'm anticipating that we probably will. On Thursday of this evening, and I know we have choir rehearsal, and we'll see who plays hooky from the choir to do this, uh, Dinner and a Movie is not on Saturday, but on Thursday at the Narrow. This one, I think, is sponsored by um, Hampton Roads Pride. And the movie, though, is Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. And if you haven't seen that, it's quite a, a classic. So that's at the Narrow at 7 o'clock. If you want to meet at dinner uh, at 545, I know that's close for those folks who are working. That may be difficult, uh, but come on if you're able to. Meals to go coming up later in the month. Uh, Morocco and Matt uh, continue to put that together. And look at the statistics down underneath that. That's coming up on the 21st is our next Meals to Go prep day. But last year in 2022, uh, we prepared 2,936 2 meals. Thank you for doing that for last year. You've continued to make that possible. But in the 14-year four, the running total, look at that, is over 41,000 meals that we've prepared and distributed to the community. So thank you for those of you who continued to do that. Coming up, is that next weekend, Charles? Next weekend. Next weekend is the winter fun weekend in West Virginia. For those of you who want to go be snow bunnies and everything else up there, you don't have to ski or that. It, last decisions to co, talk to Charles today, and he can get you all in there. A couple of things just for us to hold in our prayers as we go into this new year. So much is going on in our lives. So much is going on in our communities. So much is going on in the world. Let's take a moment as we go into this new year to just renew our commitment to just pick up the phone and call somebody you hadn't heard of in a, from in a while. Mm -hmm. and I didn't say heard about. I had said heard from because lots of times we hear about somebody and we think, oh, I know about them, but they haven't heard your voice and you haven't heard theirs in a while. And sometimes just say, hey, how you doing? You don't have to say, look what the cat drug in or anything like that, but just to let somebody know, even send a text sometimes is nice. And uh, can we commit together to do that in this year? I think that's a good thing for us to be able to do. Gracious God, as we open our hearts to you in this time of prayer, we just uh, take a moment to center ourselves in the silence of this moment. And as we continue in a spirit of prayer, knowing that prayer is relationship with God and each other, and that there are times even in our lives when we may feel like we can't pray or don't know how to pray, and it's then that we claim God's promise from Scripture that God's Spirit somehow in the mystery of faith and life finds us in those moments and knows how to hold us as we hold each other. I bring praises and thanks from Ellen who had gender affirmation surgery this week up in Charlottesville. And Ellen was so overjoyed and I know that Ellen doesn't mind me outing her in this way at age 72 to be able to do this and to live into the wholeness of who she is. Can I hear an amen to that? Yeah. And I'll just add too a thanks to the staff at the University of Virginia Medical Center up there. They were so supportive, so attentive. Uh, from the get-go all the way through. It was really nice. And, of course, I had a good chuckle about that as I walked down the hall out of the surgical suite, came a young doctor that had a UNC surgical cap on. And, of course, out of my mouth said, Go Heels. They were almost ready to call security when I did that in the middle of Wahoo land up there. 
Let's also continue to hold uh, in our prayers Odessa and Carolyn uh, as they're facing continuing health challenges. And no doubt there are other folks that you know that we need to hold up. James, it's glad to have you here this week yeah. after you had some challenges this week too. And just to know that as we go forward in the wholeness of life that sometimes, and don't be afraid to pick up the, call, the phone and say, hey, I'm not feeling too well today or I'm not doing okay. Will you keep me in prayer? Our prayer and intercessory group continues to do that. Text any of our care team or to me, let us know uh, how you're doing. Ben, would you come and give words to our prayer today? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and thank you for getting us through another season, holiday season, Lord. We ask that you would just be with us, Lord, and be with all those in front of us, Lord, all those that's in charge of us, Lord, that we will be able to be able to do the things that is well-pleasing in thy sight and that we will be able to uh, show others your love, Lord, and, and the love that you have given us, Lord, that we will be able to pour it out to others that they will be able to see where to go and where to turn when they need help, Lord. And we ask that you just be with us and be with our families throughout the rest of this new year, Lord, and that you will help us to be successful and, and supportive to all those around us. In your son's name, amen. Reading today from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the Magi secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go, and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way.
be seated. So they came. They came bearing gifts. They brought pavement. They brought a scented candle. And they brought mothballs. You think, what are you talking about? Well, doesn't the scripture tell us that the streets in heaven are paved with what? Gold. Gold. So they brought pavement. <laughs> Frankincense, they brought a nice scented candle from Yankee Candle or somewhere. And, and myrrh was often used to uh, around the bodies, so it was like mothballs, wasn't it? Somebody said, what did Mary do with all that stuff? She probably, I like the cartoon that said Mary would have much preferred they brought pampers <laughs> or a can of formula or just watched the baby for a little bit while she got a little bit of sleep, maybe. I say all that to say this, that as we begin this new year, let's think about how the gifts that we bring to God and the intent, not just the intentions of our heart, but the practical uses of our heart from our hands to our feet to ourselves to our offerings and how we're using that to be good stewards of all that God has given us. And, oh, God, may we indeed instill in us that generous compassion of your spirit that we offer ourselves and all that we are and that we strive to make a difference in your name as so many have for us. Lead us and inspire us. Give us insight and wisdom. Open our eyes as we go into this new year, as we offer ourselves, receive your offerings, and share them as well. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. I invite you to give as God's Spirit leads you to give today. You can get up and put something in the offering plate. We don't pass them, but you can feel free at any time to get up and put something there. You can go online, newlifemcc.net, click on the giving tab. A little tab will drop down again. Click again, and you can give that way. Give through the mail or the mailbox on the, the church porch. Uh, feel free to give of yourself. And this year, there are going to be lots of opportunities for us to be together inside of this house and where? outside of this house as well. And may we respond as God leads us today. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your generosity and compassion. I invite you to give as God's Spirit leads you today. Love to give up. 
offer our thanks today for these gifts. Please God allow us to use these gifts to give you glory in all that we do. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, here we are. Some of you have come from near and some of you have come from afar. Here we are this far away from the actual night of Jesus' birth, that we celebrate Jesus' birth. Here we are this far away some 12 days, as we talked about earlier, the 12 days of Christmas celebration of Jesus' birth in the world. Here we are at this space and place in time in the church year that we know as Epiphany. And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, for those of us who showed up, or those of us who showed up and growed up, I mean, like that, boy, that North Carolina mountain lingo, that's because I was up in Charlottesville this week. That's what it was. Um, when, when you growed up and when I growed up, some of us may have seen around the manger all the different characters, from the angels to the shepherds to the, what were they? Were they met? wise what? Could have been women too, right? Wise people. Wise people. Could, have, could have been, or maybe it was, maybe it wasn't we three kings, maybe it was we three queens. <laughs> Might fit for some of you here. But the song we just sang was, We three kings of Orient are bearing gifts. I used to think it was travel, but it's traverse. So what? Far. Far. Now, some of you are just waiting for me to say what I'm going to say next. And I might surprise you today. And for those of you who are new, you don't have a clue what we're talking about. But as I asked the question from when, or when and where and from whence did they come? Where did they come? From where? So we know that their profession were volunteer fire people, right? <laughs> You knew I'd have to say it, but you've been saying it all along. I didn't have to say from afar. You've been saying it for me. But could it have been that they wasn't the same night? Wasn't it? And some historians and people who study this and know more about it than I do say that it could have been as much as a year to two years after the birth that these wise queens or kings or whoever they were showed up. And we think about that. Now, my grandson just turned one back in October, so he's like 14 months. And so we think about that one-year celebration, and he's into doggies. He says, goggies. He likes goggies. 
And, you know, what, what was it when you were growing up? What was your favorite thing? Do you remember any birthday parties that you might have had or were they themed or anything like that? I, my, the first two movies I ever saw in the theater, and it was, no, this was after the, the there were talkies, by the way, for those of you who don't know how, how old I am, was Disney's Jungle Book. There was the animated version, the old version, and Swiss Family Robinson. Those were two that stuck. And out of those came what I wanted for my first, my few birthdays, but I never got it. And I'll talk about that in a moment. But that Jungle Book thing, and I'm going to digress for here for a minute, so I'm going to chase a rabbit. And as long as I chase a rabbit, you've got to chase it long enough till it comes back to the hole. You with me on this? Yeah. Are you with me on this? Yeah. I don't know about some of you. So in that Jungle Book movie, the things that come back to my mind is old Baloo the bear. Remember the, the, the image of evil or violence or hatred or just danger in that movie was who? Do you remember? Not just the snake. The tiger. Remember Shere Khan, the tiger? And old Baloo the bear has old Shere Khan by the tail, and he's saying, help, help, help. Somebody help me turn loose of this thing. They said, let go of the tail. He says, no, the other end's got teeth. I don't know how you feel right now, but sometimes I feel like the other end of this world's got teeth and I'm just holding on for dear life as we go through. And then there are the buzzards in that particular movie. You remember the buzzards that were setting up there at the end? There were, I thought there were three, which was going to match the three queens, but there are actually four. And I think they were named, let's see, what were they named? They were named Buzzy, Flaps, Ziggy, and Dizzy. I didn't know that. That's some trivia for you. I told you, follow this rabbit a little bit with me. And the song they sang was, That's What What? Do you remember? That's What Friends Are For. And so these buzzards are up there. You know, they're doing this. And then they start asking, what do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? You tell me what I want to do. And they're doing this back and forth. Do this a little bit. And look around set to your neighbor and say, what do you want to do? And say back to your neighbor, I don't know, what do you want to do? <laughs> I think we better leave that right there. <laughs> but I digress again. But this image in the middle of this Disney movie of the buzzards and about the cycle of life and of death brings us back maybe to this idea of the epiphany and the gifts that they brought because some say that those gifts that they brought reminded us or was prophetic of what would happen in the journey of Jesus' life. Now, again, I digress. I mentioned another movie, Swiss Family Robinson. You remember, any of you see that, remember see that movie? Or maybe you saw it years and years later after your parents did. And, and the, the hot guy that I remember in there was the guy that would eventually be Dano on the original Hawaii Five-0, James MacArthur. Do you remember him? And he was trying to ride an ostrich, but it wasn't a birthday party with an ostrich I wanted. I wanted a birthday party with baby elephants and chimps. Oh, my goodness. I just thought that would be the most wonderful thing in the world to look out in our front yard. That, well, we used to call it the pasture. Mom insists that it be called the front yard now. And see, you have a baby elephant out there. I would be so popular with everybody if I had done that. My goodness. Well, Jesus didn't get baby elephants. Jesus didn't get clowns. Now, I know clowns are scary today. Or ponies even. But Jesus got magi or magi, however you want to pr pronounce it. Can we say magicians in a way? Because they were astrologers. They were practitioners of an ancient faith that somehow used the stars to guide them to this place that Jesus would be. And we ask again, where did they come from and how did they even know? And supposedly they came from old Persia. Well, if you think about it, it sort of begins to make sense that we can connect a few of the dots. Where about 2,700 years ago or more, where were the people of Israel enslaved? In old Persia. Is it possible, could it be that the faith of those early Israelites were somehow transferred or held on to by some folks who were there and whether they understood it or not, whether they believed it or not, they were watching and they watched the night sky and they saw what would appear.
Now, as we think about all this, there's an article, and I think, Kathleen, I think you sent it to me this week, but it's been circulating in other MCC cir uh, cir circulations too, suggesting that was it possible that Mary was even a slave? What? Really? How could that be? Well, and there's some things that do, it doesn't leave, that theory doesn't leave uh, an explanation for with regard to how does Joseph fit into all of that. But if Mary were a slave, and, and the word that she uses or that's used and put into Mary's words in the New Testament is often used when she says, I'm a servant of the Lord. In most cases, it's about being a slave. Wow, what a different take on that. What a different epiphany, if you will, that that would give to us to think about that. My, my, my. And if that's not queer enough for you, think about the words that one of our own MCC writers and theologians herself, as she quotes uh, Reverend Dr. Nancy Wilson, and I'm talking about Kittredge Cherry. Bernie, you probably know Kittredge, and we all know Nancy Wilson. She wrote, Although they were often called three kings, the Magi stand in contrast to the worldly King Herod, who sought world domination by massacring the holy innocents who might grow up to take his throne. The wise, the wise magi who followed the star to find the newborn Jesus were more likely wizards who provide a higher wisdom or astrologists with expertise in cosmic balance. The magi played the shamanic role often filled by, get this, eunuchs, an ancient term, believe it or not, for LGBTQ people. That's, she's quoting Nancy Wilson in her book, Outing the Bible, Queer Folks, God, Jesus, and the Christian Scriptures. Nancy writes, They were Zoroastrian priests, astrologers, magicians, ancient shamans from the courts of ancient Persia. They were the equivalent of Merlin of Britain. They were sorcerers, high-ranking officials, but not kings, definitely not kings. But quite possibly, she says, they were queens. We've always pictured them with elaborate, exotic, unusual clothing, quite festive, highly decorated, and accessorized. See where it's going? <laughs> accessorized. I like that. Also, the wise eunuchs, the shamans, the holy men were the only ones who had the forethought, for, I like this part too, the forethought to go shopping before they visited baby Jesus. <laughs> As Nancy Wilson pointed out, Kittredge Cherry says, the Magi were often depicted wearing gorgeous, elaborate attire. Eunuchs and cross-dressers were surprisingly common in the Mediterranean world of the Bible and later. Wow. Yes, now we digress for a moment to think about all that, but if we think about an epiphany being not just something worldwide, but maybe even in our own personal lives, I ask the question, what epiphanies are we, have we had in our lives that give us, whether we make sense of it or not, or whether we're still struggling to know what to believe, or in our faith journey, it's about believing and doubt along the way that goes hand in hand that draws us closer to God and closer to each other. Can I hear amen? amen. And so Jesus was born into a world that might seem strange. It was a world that, yes, looked at astrology, that looked at the skies, and they took dreams literally. When those wise queens or kings, wherever they came from, when they actually ended up there, what happened in a dream? Do you remember? And in the dream to tell them what? Go back another way. Don't you go back to Herod. You know, Herod's pretending that he wants to come and worship the baby Jesus too. But, and then he calls all of his wise people to say, what happened? He said, well, the baby's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And then we're thinking, well, wait a minute. Did they show up in Bethlehem? Were Jer Mary and Joseph and, and the baby still there? How could this be if it was a year or two later? If you look carefully at those scriptures and in, in all the translations, it doesn't say that the place they found Jesus was Bethlehem. It says the stars came to rest over the place where Jesus was. So now we can sort of begin to connect the dots, but let's not chase that rabbit too far. Let's go back to that other question. The Magi experienced an epiphany in that moment. Whether they understood it or not, they realized that they were being confronted by evil. And in that moment, in that confrontation of evil, the presence of the holy was there. In your life, in my life, where are we conscious or if we, maybe we're only conscious reflecting back on where we felt that confrontation, maybe not confrontation of evil, but that aha moment 
where we realized it, maybe we didn't understand it at the time. Maybe we can only now fully begin to understand it, that God was present and maybe saved us from having to face some worse disastrous consequences that we, oh my goodness, I bet most of us can think of at least a few things in our lives that if this hadn't happened, how much worse it would have been for us. How about that old saying there, but for the grace of God go I. Dr. Bill Leonard, who has been instrumental in helping to found the Divinity School at Wake Forest University, which was connected to Baptist, by the way, way back when. And Wake Forest University used to be, or Wake Forest College used to be in Wake Forest, North Carolina, just north of, of where NC State is and just a little bit uh, sort of northeast, I guess, of where Duke is and, and about a few miles from that great and hallowed southern part of heaven known as Chapel Hill. <laughs> and, and that's where you got the big four way back when. And then back in the 50s, the Reynolds Aluminum and Tobacco Company offered to foot the bill if they'd moved Wake Forest to Winston-Salem, which is Wake Forest University now. They sold their soul to tobacco and they left. The Divinity School stayed in place and became Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary, which is when I went to school. And when I went there the first time, it was very progressive. Not progressive enough to accept that their pastors could be gay, but as far as ordaining women and those kind of things. And then this fundamentalist, or we used to say back home, the fundamentalist uh, resurrection or insurrection came and changed all that, and they became ultra-conservative. Out of all that came a resurgence of the Divinity School at what was, is now Wake Forest University. When I went to Winston-Salem as my first MCC church, I was surprised because Wake Forest University at that time offered domestic partner benefits. And this was in the early 2000s. And the associate pastor of Wake Chapel, the church on campus, was lesbian. Can you believe that? I went to see Bill Moyers. Do you remember Bill Moyers who was press secretary for President Johnson? And then he went on to have journalistic fame and I think CBS and some other things. And he spoke there and he warned back then of the connection between the religious right, the political right, and the socioeconomic right. And he said they're all connected in a way that they're after power and control. And they feed on each other. Have we not seen that? May we pray for our country today because we know that that marriage of all that coming together and usurping all of what's holy, also they're trying to use that to stir up folks in so many ways. May we continue to pray for our leaders who aren't afraid to stand up for justice. I don't know if you were up late the other night when all that stuff, the, the clown show was going on in Congress. Uh, and then when the minority leader came up, uh, Hakeem Jeffries, to give his speech and this wonderful thing with A to Z of things that we're going to continue to stand for about justice. I'm not being partisan here. I'm talking about justice issues. And of course, then he got to M, and I sort of had to chuckle a little bit. He said, we stand for maturity over Mar Largo. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you just got to be real in some way. When I heard Bill Leonard, though, talk about that, and I happened to run into my college Sunday school teacher. She was married to the pastor of University Baptist Church, Dr. Downey, and he was an incredible person, incredible speaker. And she told me one day, she said, you cut that God talk out and talk about your faith. That challenged me. That was an epiphany moment for me. For me to say, wow, maybe I've, you know, am repeating a lot of this stuff. And I grew up, you know, you know, I grew up in hellfire and brimstone. I was never hellfire and brimstone in the Baptist church, but I heard it. And it's so easy for us to repeat those mantras and to start maybe even believing it. And we think sometimes that we're very progressive because we believe it's okay to be LGBTQAI plus, right? Mm -hmm. But sometimes we haven't come too far from our fundamentalist roots. And so maybe our epiphany moment in this year means that we need to grow into where God wants us to be, not what we grew up in. Not, not putting off those things that are near and dear to our heart, but some stuff is like the old preacher said one time, won't count for a hill of beans when we get to heaven. 
We need the discernment to know the difference, I think, sometimes. Well, I hadn't seen my Sunday school teacher in a long time, so walking down the aisle, I'm trying to get over to speak to Bill Moyers because I want to shake his hand, you know, and tell him who I am. And I'm the new pastor at MCC Winston-Salem, and I wore my clergy collar because I used to be Baptist, but I was proud to wear my MCC collar because I transitioned over. I, I don't know what she was trying to tell me back there. Put but your hand down. You're blocking oh, I'm blocking my mic. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I didn't want you to hear that. <laughs> or I didn't want the people at home to hear it. That's what it was. Okay. Thank you. So... I'm making my over, and lo and behold, there I run into my college Sunday school teacher I hadn't seen in years. And she stops right in front of me, and she says, Mark Bird, is that you? And I said, yes, Miss Downey, is that you? And she said, yes. And she said, I have been so worried about you. And I thought, she knows I'm gay. <laughs> she said, I've been worried about you since in my Sunday school class I told you to stop that God talk. And I thought I had hurt you and because then I didn't see you after a while. And she said, where, she said, she pointed my collar. She said, where are you now? And I said, I'm pastor of the Metropolitan Community Church of Winston-Salem. She goes, oh, the gay church? <laughs> I said, yes, Miss Downey. She said, oh, I am so proud of you. And she hugs me right there. And my goodness. And by that time, Dr. Leonard and Bill Moyer's coming down. And she turns around and she says, I want you to meet Mark Bird. He was in my Sunday school class and I told him to quit that God talk. So he, he, he's gay and he's pastor of MCC Winston-Salem. <laughs> Sometimes those epiphany moments will come when you least expect them. Sometimes we may be afraid to be who we are. Sometimes we may be listening, need to listen, whether it's the dreams of our heart or where the Spirit is leading us to go another way. And sometimes, just like chasing that rabbit back around, we have to come home again every once in a while too. I say this a lot. Remember the prophet Elijah depressed on the floor of the cave and the Spirit of God speaking to Elijah in a whisper voice, Why are you here? Get up and eventually telling Elijah to go back the way he came. We need the discernment to know when to go back the way we came and when to go another way. And only God's Spirit, sometimes individually, sometimes in those deep moments of the night when we're afraid to do anything else, sometimes it's God's Spirit that in that whisper, or maybe in a voice that we don't expect, Maybe in a world that's still crazy with astrology or literal dreams or whatever, that God's Spirit still finds me and you in a way that truly makes a difference. Sometimes maybe it's in confronting evil that we have those moments. I hate to even say what I'm about to say, but I'm going to say it anyway. When the previous administration was elected... I think we learned a lot of things about ourselves and our neighbors and our community and our world that maybe we didn't realize. I'm afraid that we thought we had made much more progress for justice and inclusion and acceptance and tolerance than perhaps what we have actually made because when that administration came in, all of a sudden people felt enabled, they felt empowered, they felt emboldened to say what they were really thinking maybe all along. They came out of the closet. They came out of their hateful closet. That's right. So as we think about that and think about what that has done or does do or mean for you and I to gay moving forward, may we not be naive. I talked about that hot, hunky Dano riding that ostrich in Swiss Family Robinson. Ostriches sometimes do what? Put their head in the sand. Let us not, as we go into this year, put our heads in the sand. Let us not discount the fact that God is our God and leading us forward no matter what evils we may have to confront in the world. Now, I want to go back to this idea of, I'm just going to throw away about six to maybe do a dozen of these pages from my sermons. So, are you okay with that? Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> I don't know. Somebody back there, there was one, well, I think now the new rules in Congress say that the one objecting voice can call for a vote to oust the speaker. I heard one objecting voice. Thank you. I'll go back and put those pages back in. <laughs> We'd like to think that we have come a long way in the world. But if we look at the statistics, my goodness, the shootings, the police-involved shootings surpassed his historical records this past year, too. And it's not just children being killed, but children shooting adults and adults, adults, and all of this... How do we have any hope? How do we make sense in this world? And I want to go back to that little term that we sort of glossed over, magi or magi, however you want to pronounce it. I'm not talking about MAGA. We know that was make the world gay again, right? (laughs) But if we think about it, and I Googled this just to see what would come up when I typed in M-A-G-I, and you know what came up? Modified Adjusted Gross Income. (laughs) Lions and tigers and bears and bulls of Wall Street. You didn't know this was going to be a stewardship sermon. We're going to take a third and a fourth offering today. I'm kidding only. Maybe not. Have we counted the offering? No, no, I'm kidding about that. Some churches do that, you know. They count the offering during the service, and if it ain't enough, we're going to pass them again. We may be taking back some of the chicken afterwards, too. So we know what adjusted gross income is, right? I mean, that's where you you take away the deductions for your tax purposes, the things that you're able to to digest and deduct. And you're you're hearing somebody talk about this that absolutely pays somebody every year to do my taxes because I don't know anything about this stuff. So I looked it all up. So if we think about a modified adjusted gross income, that's where things get added back from what I understand to make you eligible or to see if you're eligible for certain tax credits and other benefits. When we think about how many of you are frequent flyers or how many of you like to go to Kroger and then realize when you got some Kroger points, you can get 10 cents off on a gallon of gas at Kroger. How many of us shop at at different stores that you get certain cash, whether it's Macy's cash or Kohl's cash? And, you know, that's a ploy to get you to come back and spend more, right? But, boy, we get excited. I get excited about it when I got some cash to go spend. And I'm thinking it doesn't want to stay in my pocket too long because I don't want it to expire. (laughs) So what if, what if, just thinking for a minute, and I saw this on TikTok, don't tell the government, there, there was this guy talking about somebody who died and went to heaven. And he got to the pearly gates, and Peter said, uh, you know, you got to have 100 points to get into heaven. <laughs> and the guy said, all right, let's see how I stack up. Let me pull up my record here, my spending record. Let me see what I've got. And so he said, well, I have been faithful to my spouse for almost 50 years. And Peter says, well, all right, that's good. You get five points for that. He said, five? Yeah, five, right? (laughs) You know what he's thinking, right? (laughs) I might could have traded those five points for some good time along the way. (laughs) So so then he says, well, all right, what else have you got? He said, well, I I was an an active member of the board at my church. I never missed a Sunday. And he said, I'll give you two points for that. And then he said something about it. Well, I volunteered at the soup kitchen, and I did this. He said, I'll give you three points for that. Well, that's 10, right? And the guy said, wait a minute. At this rate, at this rate, only by the grace of God am I going to get into heaven. Well, 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 we are what? Saved by grace through faith. So I'd like to suggest that Magi, MAGA is not modified gross adjusted income, but can we call it modified adjusted grace, Mm -hmm. improvement, increase, index, whatever term you want to give it. 
And as we look for those moments that are epiphany moments us to think about that God is going to continue to give us the grace that's necessary. There's scripture in Paul's letter to the church at Rome that says, All the more that sin increases, grace increases. Now, I don't know about you, in the Hellfire and Brimstone Church, that was aimed at me, telling me all my sins. I told you before, some of us back home would sort of be tempted to push somebody else out in the aisle after we'd gone on 20 minutes in the altar call because we wanted to get home and watch Dallas on Sunday night. Until somebody came to confess sins, it wasn't going to happen. But I got to thinking, maybe that scripture is not just aimed at an individual. Maybe it's about the worldview. That all the evil in the world can do whatever the evil in the world is doing, and all the more, it's still not going to outdo grace. It's still not going to outdo God's love. And that's very personal, and yet it's very communal in all that we do. Bishop Stephen Charleston, who was an Episcopal bishop and was the dean and president of the Divinity School up in um, Massachusetts at the Episcopal Divinity School before it closed. He's now retired, but he's also very much connected to, because he's Native American in his heritage. And it's, there's a wonderful way that he seems to be able to reconcile both his Christian, his belief in Jesus and, and that of his na Native American heritage too. And it just seems to go together. And if you think about God's grace, I was sitting on the front row this morning, not just listening to the choir, but watching the choir. And as I looked across this, a smile came on my face and I thought, well, they, they're going to think I'm grinning at something's up, like telling me that I was covering my mic. But what I was... Even, I'll even say laughing inside about was the wonderful diversity that I saw up here and the wonderful diversity that I see looking out here and we think about how that just blows us away in God's grace. So Bishop Stephen Charleston wrote this, the length of night is not measured by hours but by the worry that we carry with us into the darkness. For a burdened heart, the minutes move more slowly than memory. The visual world recedes and we're left like watchmen to keep our lonely vigil high on the solemn walls of our fear. And when you face a long night of your soul, let go of time and kindle again the flame of hope entrusted to you by the Spirit. It never fails to burn bright. You are the keeper of that flame a citizen of light only passing through the shadows on your way home. A flame of God. Modified, adjusted grace in your life and in my life. May we be open to that as we go forward this day. The Lord is with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks and praise. It is right indeed, O Lord, to give you thanks and praise. And so we lift our voices with all the saints and angels and proclaim your glory in unending praise as we praise together, saying... Gracious and merciful God, creator of us all, in this moment as your Holy Spirit finds each of us as we come humbly to this table of grace, this table of community, this table of thanksgiving. It is your Holy Spirit that finds each of us alone and individual, but at the same time connecting us to you and to each other. Fill us up on this celebration of Epiphany and may your spirit of awareness Lead us on, whether it's to go back the way we came or whether it's to go new ways and new paths and to discover them together. We are ever so mindful and thankful of your presence, not only behind us, beside of us, but ahead of us in this journey. Pour out your Spirit now upon the gifts on this table, the gifts that we hold in our hand, and the gifts that people throughout the week may hold wherever they are, whoever they are, and with whomever they're with. We thank you. We praise you. Draw us closer to you and closer to each other. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Jesus took from the Passover table perhaps what was left, common elements, bread and the cup. 
He took the bread and he blessed it and broke it and said, this is my body. You know, I like the translation that said, this is my body opened to you. As often as you receive it, I'm there receiving you. In the same way, he took the cup and poured the cup and blessed it. I find it so interesting that he gave it to every single person around that table. And you know that who that also included? Yeah. And he said, this is the new covenant. It is grace, it is mercy, it is forgiveness all wrapped up into one. It's already yours. All you have to do is receive it. And maybe even share it once in a while. I add that because as we come to this table, it's easy for us to hold it within ourselves. But my goodness, the grace of God can't be contained in one human heart. The grace of God can't be contained in one worship space. The grace of God, I know I say this to it, becomes cliche. It's behind, say it with me. It's behind me, it's beside of me, and it's ahead of me. We claim that for ourselves and others today. As we claim it for ourselves, say it with gusto. It is for me. It is for me. I'm not even going to ask you to say it three times today because you said it pretty good that time. (laughs) Now look to somebody else, and this gets a little more tricky here. Look to one or two people without going all generic. Look around and somebody you haven't said it to before and say, it is for you too. Now, I'm going to ask you to say that one again with a little more gusto because we're a little bit timid when it comes to that, aren't we? I'm not, believe me, I'm not the street preacher kind of guy, so I'm not asking you to be a street preacher. I'm just asking you to smile the light of God to somebody else. Say it to somebody else you hadn't said to before. It is for you too. (laughs) And the person who has not a clue in in the aisle at the grocery store looking at you says, okay, if it is for me too, give it to me. Today we proclaim the great miracle and mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ shall come again. Hallelujah. My brothers and sisters, children of God, all of you, it's not about being a member of this church or of any other church. It's about celebrating the grace of God, the love of God, the mercy and compassion that God has for you right now in your journey. And you may not want to be connected to anybody right now. You may just feel like you want to just sort of be by yourself. Or you may be, oh, I've got to have a hug. I've got to be connected. God is in the middle of all of that. You may feel like I'm the worst person in the world or I can't get over, let alone forgiving somebody else. I can't even forgive myself. Sometimes that's the hardest person to forgive. In the midst of all that, we claim God's spirit of forgiveness today, do we not? Can we hear an amen to that? So I invite you, whether it's your home today or whether here, as we share together in a moment, I'm going to ask you to rise as you're able as we sing the chorus that's in there. And we're going to sing it together. And then we will share together as the body of Christ. If you're at home, go get a cup of juice, a cup of wine, a cookie or cracker. And if you're here and you didn't get one of the individual communion packets, if you'll raise your hand, someone will bring it to you. And after we sing this chorus, we will share together the body of Christ. Would you rise as you're able? We share together the body of Christ.
in the cup of grace and mercy and salvation. I invite you to remain as you are as we sing together the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray. Our closing song today. You have to be careful what you say because sometimes it'll come back and bite you in the backside. 
Last Sunday, I made the comment that, you know, it was New Year's Day. You got to be careful what you do on New Year's Day because my granny used to say you end up doing it the whole rest of the year. Morocco brought it back and kicked me in the backside with it. He said, look at the clock. You let us out early on New Year's Day. (laughs) So in, in respect to hopefully a Congress that will lead us, I will yield back the balance of my time today. But I say that. To say, to say this, don't let this be your only time with God or others this week. Go now in the grace and mercy and peace of Almighty God. God bless you, my friends, and thank you for being here. Oh,